What I proposed, I've actually only written two sections of. Um, as I got into it, as it often happens, I found there's more and more to write and less and less time to actually do it. So I'm going to read some of it, and then towards the end, I'll just sort of go through these, these talking points, and then we can get into some good discussion, hopefully, about Anselm. And um, I'd been wanting to write on, on Anselm and, and marriage and sexual desire for, for a long time. Uh, there's not an awful lot in Anselm about these topics. So you have to, to some degree, extrapolate from his, his writings on, on other things. For example, his many discussions of, of friendship. We'll see why in just a moment. Um, that's not actually in here. What I, what I have in here is the stuff where he actually does talk, at least you know, tangentially, <coughs> about marriage, conjugal love, sexual desire. He doesn't use the term conjugal love, which is going to come about, um, it's going to, there's going to be sort of a flowering of monastic writing on, on marriage, on love, on all these sorts of things in the 12th century. Um, but Anselm is uh, not really in that current at all. He's, he's a little bit before that. So what can we call out of text by or about Anselm having to do with these topics? One particularly fruitful discussion to examine occurs in, in the Vita Anselmi. Traveling in, in England on monastery business, Anselm is sought out by people of all orders of life, that is, monks, clerics, and lay people, and he orders his conversations with them to their ways of life and their, their characters, including to the married lay. And you have that, that extended passage there. To married persons, he taught how great was the fidelity, love, and companionship with which they should be bound together, both in matters pertaining to God and to things of this world, that the man on his side should love his wife as himself, knowing none other than, but her, having regard for the welfare of her body as of his own, and entertaining no evil suspicions. That the woman likewise should submit to her husband with all loving obedience, that she should diligently encourage him in well-doing, and calm his spirit with her mildness, if he were perchance unjustly stirred up against anyone. So this is a passage very rich in implications. One of these is that Anselm clearly regards marriage as a relationship whose purposes or ends cannot be reduced to social order, mutual usefulness, enjoyment of sexual pleasure, or even procreation. Those bound together, the coniugitos, ought to engage in intercourse, oriented and inhabited especially by this mutual fidelity, love, and companionship. Marriage is its own sort of friendship, calling for the redemare, loving in return, that numerous later authors will uh, invoke. And, and Probably a good place to go to that would be uh, Leclerc's Monks in Marriage, where he has a whole you know, chapter on this. Second, it's worth noting that the division of roles within the relationship, which flow from this more general requirement of mutual affection, uh, exhibited in eternal and temporal, sacred and, and secular matters. To late modern ears, what stands out immediately is what appears to be sort of a traditional affirmation of wifely obedience and subjection. A slightly more literal rendering of the passage about obedience would read, the woman ought to comply with the man in complete love and submission, where this last term, submissio, could also denote modesty, gentleness, humility. That such, such submission as anything but blind and questioning obedience is very clear, given that the wife's role also includes encouraging or exhorting her husband and attempting to calm him when unjustly angered. So several letters by Anselm to noble wives thank and praise them for precisely this sort of behavior. His exchanges with Queen Matilda are very interesting as an example. Anselm not only praises her attempts to bring out reconciliation between himself and her husband, King Henry, uh, that is to lessen the unjust and damaging anger of the king against the archbishop, he suggests to her that she try to steer him away from bad counselors. He also advises her not only to take care for her soul, but to encourage her husband to do likewise. He says, reflect upon these things, tell them to our Lord King in, pu in private, and in public, and repeat them often. So this is far from a meek and acquiescent submissiveness that Anselm is putting forth as, as her wifely duty to Matilda. In fact, one might go so far as to say that wives are supposed to participate in, or at least aid and encourage, moral uh, deliberation and decision-making in which their husbands are involved. Anselm clearly does not regard or treat women as men's inferiors in their moral or rational capacities. He tells Matilda, I am fully aware that you can distinguish between good and evil through the understanding of your mind. And he suggests that she intercede precisely so that she can help her husband realize what would be advantageous or beneficial for him, thereby herself doing what is befitting to you and what is advantageous for him. 
He does not hesitate to address her complaints about his side of the conflict through offering her moral reasonings, expecting her in turn to make this case to her husband. Letters 248 and 249 to Robert of Flanders and his wife Clementia exhibit this general approach as well. Anselm writes to Robert, with whom he's enjoyed previous conversations and hospitality, and praised and exhorted as a good Christian ruler, in order to encourage him further as a, quote, good example to other princes. And then he writes to Clementia, telling her that Robert's good action was not done without his prudent clemency, so I am certain it was not done without your clement prudence. <laughs> Even though Anselm depicts this pair as demonstrating themselves to be true children and faithful advocates of the church, the spouse of God, precisely because they carry out what pertains to the Christian religion in complete agreement, so that, that concordia, he nevertheless urges, it is your duty to mention this and other similar things frequently to your husband in season and out of season. So again, you know, not sort of keep your head down, you know. Anselm further asks her to admonish uh, Monere and to counsel Robert in these matters. So a wife's role within the relationship of marriage involves her... Got some pages mixed up. Um, involves her um, keeping her husband on track morally. This does not mean, of course, that she's responsible for her husband's moral failures or vices unless she's contributed to them. A third set of implications worth exploring emerge from the duties on the husband's side. Anselm stresses his obligation to love his wife as himself, which implies a voluntary equalization of culturally unequal statuses. Anselm also insists the husband is to care for the wife's body as his own, that is to provide for her bodily needs and legitimate desires, which would by implication include sexual desire. A husband is also to exhibit marital fidelity, knowing no one else but his spouse. In fact, Anselm chastens the Irish king, uh, Murkatak, for countenancing what appear to be some pretty extreme violations of monogamous commitment. In his first letter, Anselm writes, We've heard that in your kingdom marriages are being dissolved and altered without any grounds. His second letter is more explicit. It's said that husbands freely and publicly exchange their wives for the wives of others, as if they're exchanging one horse for another or anything, whatever, for something from someone else, or they abandon them at their pleasure and without reason. So in Anselm's view, this represents practices and indeed aspects of a culture, as he says, entirely against the Christian religion. Omnimodi, contrario. Infidelity to one's spouse violates not only the commitment of marriage, but the purposes and duties comprised within marriage. In the De Similitudinibus, Anselm uses infidelity and susceptibility to seduction as a metaphorical likeness for the fallen and prideful human will. He says, the will is placed between God and the devil in a way like a wife between her legitimate husband or rightful husband and some would-be adulterer. Her husband charges her that she should be conjoined to him alone, but the adulterer persuades her that she should copulate with him. And so if she is conjoined only to her rightful husband, she is a rightful wife, and she generates legitimate children. But if she joins herself to the adulterer, she is herself an adulteress and brings forth adulterous children. This is a vital master metaphor within Anselm's thought. When a spouse transgresses by breaking the bond of marital fidelity, pursuing or being seduced by some other sexual partner, this reflects the volition of, the unfaith of that unfaithful spouse. And their will, in turn, is turned aside from what it ought to will, from being conjoined with its legitimate spiritual spouse, that is, the will of God. So in a marriage, there's, there's, you know, in my case, my wife who I should be conjoined with. My will should also be conjoined to the will of God. And I can commit, by committing adultery against her, I also am an adulterer against God. The unfaithful person's will is conjoined with the devil's and is thereby seduced into willing something other than what it ought to will. Given Anselm's analyses of volition, what is wrongfully willed is at the very least twofold. One wills whatever it is that motivates the will in this case, for example, inordinate or illegitimate enjoyment of sexual pleasure. Um, one also at the same time wills through and to have an autonomous will, appropriate voluntas. We were discussing how to translate this well. It could be self-will as well. A will that one would like to be subject to no one else's and nothing other than itself but which ends up being captivated by, even subjected to its own desires and their objects. In the case of unchastity and adultery, a variety of different motives could provide the reason for the person's wrong willing, ranging from revenge to prestige, from curiosity to desire to fit in, I think of our own culture. Uh, 
But in most cases, one can imagine that sexual desire, that is, desire for sexual pleasure, would be of primary importance. So this prompts us to ask what Anselm's views on sexual desire and the enjoyment of sexual intercourse would be. One natural place to begin would be a second meditation explicitly focused on virginity unhappily lost. There he employs the language of uncleanness, loss, stench, and filth. He calls fornication a soiler of his mind. His soul is an adulterer from Christ, her rightful spouse, and is a stubborn whore, a brazen fornicator, leaving her rightful spouse and coupling with the devil. One could perhaps derive from this an interpretation of Anselm as regarding human sexuality and its desire and expression outside the marriage bond as corrosive, polluting, more dangerous and deleterious to the soul, the mind, the will, than it is to the body. Turning to the advice and admonition he provides to the unfortunate Gunhilda, the last descendant of, of King Harold, who had taken religious orders, then was kidnapped by Alan Rufus and married to his brother, Alan Niger, after Rufus's untimely death, we might draw similar inferences. He urges her, consider how great is the uncleanness of carnal pleasure. He warns of the, its consequences for her, fear of God's judgment, shame in this life, a husband who gives and promises only corruption and contemptible things, and who will, sooner or later, spurn and desert her. He tells her to leave Alan, her husband and kidnapper, to return to Christ, her lawful spouse, suggesting, we know of many holy women who, having lost their virginity, were more pleasing to God and were closer to him through penitence and their chastity than many others, even though holy in their virginity. In his second letter, he becomes more explicit in discussing the role of sexual desire and pleasure. He suggests there that mutual love or desire developed between Alan Rufus and Gunhilda, calling him your beloved lover, and arguing that she loves his brother only for similarly carnal reasons. She runs, as he says, into his embraces of which it is shameful to speak. Either he attracts her away from Christ, or she, she herself pursues him, and he receives her carnal love. At the time the letters are written, Gunhilda remains within the toils of carnal affection, stained by and still pursuing sexual pleasure, committing fornication, even while seemingly married to her captor. These letters are particularly helpful for filling in Anselm's views on marriage, conjugal love, and sexual desire for some three reasons. First, he explicitly mentions that the loss of virginity is not an impediment to a life of rectitude or holiness. Second, he notes that when discussing the wrongness of sexual pleasure, desire, and activity, he explicitly sets aside those within lawful marriage. Third, he frames the badness of cardinal pleasure and desire in terms of an adulterous and volitional turning away from God. In Gunhilda's unfortunate case, since she's become a nun, her marriage to either Alan, uh, with interesting two brothers named the same thing, would not be legitimate, and the sexual pleasure and in intercourse she engages in with him could not be other than sinful and unjust. So this leads to what for many would be the heart of the matter. The widespread caricature of Christian conceptions of sexuality and marriage construes human sexuality with its, its attendant desires, acts, and pleasures as intrinsically or necessarily sinful, shameful, disgusting, or wrong. It then views marriage and sexual intercourse within marriage, that is the act of conjugal love, as serving two ends. One is a negative end, better to marry than to burn. And I don't want to say that, that Paul is, you know, uh, in, in this, this camp, but people use that expression. And by restricting the object of one's desires and acts to one person, one can limit the deleterious effects of human sexuality. The other is a positive end, procreation, the reproduction of human nature in new human beings. One must point out that it is the sexuality of fallen human beings radically damaged in both body and soul by original sin that would be morally problematic, in need of being placed under the yoke of a marriage in which sexuality is solely to serve procreation. Does Anselm have or express such a perspective? Clearly, he considers sexual pleasure and activity outside the bounds of one marriage to be deeply wrong and morally damaging. But he also views these as entirely appropriate within the relationship of marriage. What about sexual desire itself? In our fallen condition, it's not simply what and how it ought to be. As a consequence of original sin, we are subject to the carnal appetites. He says the body became like those of brute beasts, subject to corruption and the carnal appetites. The soul, through the corruption of the body and those same appetites, and through being deprived of the goods that it lost, became infected by those carnal appetites. So our corrupted bodies weigh on our souls, and the carnal appetites come into the soul through the body. So it seems the soul itself becomes corrupted by the body. In terms of sexual desire, perhaps we experience it because of bodily drives and conditions which then affect our souls, polluting them with experienced sexual desire. Anselm explicitly rejects any such interpretation. Strictly speaking, according to him, 
there's nothing intrinsically right or wrong, good or bad, about those carnal appetites themselves, he says as a sort of long passage. Nor are those appetites just or unjust considered in themselves, for they do not make a person feeling them just or unjust, but rather unjust through the will of that person who consents to them when he or she should not. If feeling those desires without consenting to them were, were to make one unjust, then condemnation would follow. But it is not feeling them, rather consenting to them, that is a sin. If indeed these appetites were unjust in themselves, they themselves would make a person unjust when that person consented to them. But when the brute animals consent to them, they're not called unjust. Irrational animals ought to feel sexual desires in the way that they do. And indeed, even when they act on those desires, consenting to them insofar as they can consent, there is no wrong in the desire, the act, or the pleasure. The condition of human beings is different, of course, because they're endowed with reason, which means they possess a different, much more complex, free and responsible faculty of will than do other animals. Human beings can perceive and understand and orient themselves in relation to a fuller ranges of values, purposes, relationships, and persons. Their wills are not only directed towards the beneficial and away from the, the harmful, oriented by the inexpungible inclination for happiness, but also stake out positions in relation to justice and injustice, encompassing a higher type and ordering of goodness. So on the one hand, injustice, moral wrongness, or evil does not reside in those appetites themselves being felt by a human being, but rather, as Anselm says, in the rational will inordinately following them. This includes consenting the, to those desires, but could also include the intermediary delighting in, delectatio, that Anselm sets between the suggestion of desire, the suggestio, uh, the appetitus, and consent. We are, for the time being, stuck with and often beset with inordinate sexual desire, but we do at least possess the capacity to order our own volitional responses to that desire, whether we consent or not, what we choose to do, say, or even to think. On the other hand, the things carnal appetites steer us towards, including feeling sexual desire, engaging in sexual activity, enjoying sexual pleasure, while not in themselves unjust or morally wrong, if voluntary consent is not given, are in certain respects still bad, at least for rational beings. In De Kasu, Anselm notes that the will to happiness, the deep and ever-abiding complex of our desires, for what appears to us beneficial and conducive to happiness, as it gets turned away from more legitimate and fulfilling objects, it wills lower and unclean goods that the rational animals delight in. This will is then unjust and blameworthy, he says. On the side of the objects and the felt desires for animalistic enjoyments, these are lower and unclean for human beings. On the side of the will consenting to these, that is where the actual moral wrong and condemnation fall. But precisely because one is choosing things appropriate to, ration, to irrational animals, also rational animals, and not choosing what better things human beings are capable of, including the will to justice. At the same time, Anselm points out that sexual intercourse is a type of action that can be engaged in not unjustly, giving as examples the mating of irrational animals or sexual intercourse between married spouses. As noted earlier, this licitness extends not only to the act of conjugal love, but to its pleasures as well. So nowhere in his works do we see Anselm concerned with condemning or even counseling about the expression of sexual desire within marriage, even if that desire stems in part from carnal appetites. His main concerns are rather with adultery, fornication, and incompatibilities between married life and religious life, which could be an interesting topic to explore. This does not mean that once the vows are said, morally speaking, anything goes. In addition to the sorts of negative limitations and positive aspirations implicit in Anselm's advice to married people, one would presume that they ought to avoid or root out the vice of lust, which Anselm mentions and discusses in the De Similitudibus and Dicta Anselmi. His advice in those texts is primarily for the religious. Um, but presumably the state of marriage would also be one in which a Christian wife and husband are similarly called to, as he says, drive out every vice and arrange it so that evil appetite does not resist good appetite, but rather good appetite always subordinates evil to itself. This will, of course, require cultivation and right use of the will and reason, and on the part of the married couple, the mutual assistance, love, and friendship, and care that Anselm exhorts them to. Come on in. Um, to close our inquiries about the status of sexual desire and activity, we might particularize an analogy from the broader roles of the two wills in Anselm's moral theory. Human beings always possess a will as inclination, an affectio, towards happiness, towards goods recognized or, or regarded as beneficial. This is an architectonic structure of the will itself, but it's not the only one. There's also the will to justice, 
which is not always present, can be lost or abandoned, and which cannot be restored to a person solely by their own powers or efforts. To, to the degree that it's capable in a person, the will to justice encompasses, orients, and also restrains the will to happiness, which otherwise becomes more and more disordered. Marriage itself, when rightly understood and lived out, can be understood as analogous to the will to justice in a, a human being, allowing legitimate scope for sexual desire, activity, and pleasure, but maintaining it within proper bounds precisely by providing it a more encompassing ordering and orientation, one determined and revealed by the other features and goods a genuine marriage ought to include for both spouses. Um, so, if we want to fit this, then this is about all we get from, from explicit texts in Anselm. But if we want to think about this in Anselm's broader moral theory, which is where I'm trying to go with this, we want to think about marriage in, in, in terms of some of these issues. And this is not an exhaustive list by any means. We should think about how one wills justly, willing the right things for the right reasons within marriage, and then how one would will wrongly. Uh, and Anselm thinks the scriptures are a great guide for this sort of thing, you know. Um, when, he's, when he's asked, you know, how, how do you, he doesn't respond to how do you define justice, but he gives a lot of characterizations of what justice is. Sometimes it's willing what God wills us to will. But he also says in some of the letters, you know, if you want to know what God wants you to will, you should read the scriptures or use your reason, you know, and, and probably put the two of them together. So in marriage, how does this play out? Um, shaping the will to happiness, the the affectiones of, of the, the will in terms of the will of justice. That could happen within marriage, given Anselm's conceptions of things. Particularly if, the, if within the marriage, you know, the wife is supposed to actually be paying attention to her husband's moral status and exhorting him. Uh, I, I like to think that if Anselm were around today, he would have said both spouses ought to be doing that, and both spouses ought to be, you know, uh, following all, all these, these sort of things. But that's an important uh, idea. Um, what ends or goods does conjugal love that is sexual activity within marriage serve? Is, is it a, a good in itself? Is it just procreation, satisfaction of desire? Or should we see Anselm as sort of a precursor, as indeed, you know, Leclerc points out, <laughs> Um, about many of these monks writing on, on marriage in the, the 12th century, to this notion that um, procreation is not the only or fundamental good of marriage, that intimacy is. Um, you know, it, just, just for, you know, one sort of interesting case to think about, think about Samson. Uh, his parents couldn't conceive. Does that mean they stopped having sex? No. As a matter of fact, Samson is born... And it's, you know, it's, it's to some degree miraculous. But um, there's nothing in the, in the scriptures that says, yes, and then God said, for, you know, I'm going to reward you by just implanting a, a uh, you know, child without, you know, you actually engaging in, in conjugal love. Um, so I think Anselm is, is, in certain ways, a good representative, if you dig things out of his works, uh, because of this, this, you know, discussion of the, the type of love that, that a couple should have with each other for saying that the sexual act, conjugal love, should be oriented towards intimacy, towards self-donation, as, as we say now, after people like Von Hildebrand and John Paul II. Um, what happens when once wrong has been done? How do you restore a damaged marriage? That would be something that could be looked at from an Anselmian perspective. And then finally, I close by you know, thinking about what do spouses actually owe to each other? Anselm's moral theory, you know, this term debere, is, is absolutely central. Um, justice is doing what you ought to do. And there's more to it than that, but that, that ought. What is it that spouses actually do owe to each other? And if they fail to give it to each other, they're, they're falling down on the job and committing injustice. Uh, Anselm says they should be loving each other. They should be uh, developing friendship. And I think that there's a lot of resources in Anselm's discussion of friendship with, between monks and, and, and nuns, and his discussions of concordia and what it means in terms of the will that could be directly applicable to, to marriage. Uh, so I'm not going to say you know, marriage can be, should be turned into something like a little mini monastic community, because uh, obviously <laughs> these are very different vocations. And, you know, I'm way out of my depth in actually you know, speculating about that sort of thing. Um, 
But I think that, that Anselm's advice, and he gives copious, copious advice to monks and nuns about how they ought to be living out the Christian life, a lot of that would be very applicable to, to how married couples ought to uh, look at each other. So that's, that's uh, what I've got. Uh, thanks. I'm very happy to get any sort of suggestions where this should go from, from people, because uh, I think I bit off a bit more than I could easily digest. Yeah? Uh, I got a question for you, Greg. Um, since my, my own experience is much more with the variable flowering of the 12th century and yeah. beyond on these questions, um, given that Anselm doesn't have a lot specifically on this, do you have any sense of where Anselm fits in perspective of his contemporaries? I'm familiar with the idea of marriage being related to friendship as being a later concept than, than Anselm. Yeah. So was he distinctive in this regard? And have you have you discovered that? At all? Well, it's not that much later that we have the flowering. Right. You know. And where's the flowering? What sources is the flowering drawing on? You might say uh, they're they're counterpoising two classical sources: Ovid versus Cicero. Mm -hmm. Right. Ovid, you know, they, they read The Art of Love and they commented on it. Sometimes they allegorized it. You know. Some of the, Sometimes they just read it. It's so, a you know, funny book. Um, <laughs> Cicero's day, you know, on friendship, his De Amicitia, was read. And that's where this red amare comes from that attains such an important status as loving in return. What, is that, what does that comprise? And Cicero, you know, of course, saw it as primarily between men, not between a, a, a man and his wife. He had some terrible relations with his wife. Uh, but the monks, you know, in, in the, the 12th century were applying this, the De Amicitia explicit to, to marriage. And I think Anselm, he's reading it. He's, you know, he's, he's got a library at, at, at hand. Um, I think it's, it's one of those things that we don't have a lot of discussions about it because he just didn't talk about it much. It was more orally uh, counseled than, than otherwise. The one other thing I want to point out, too, is I, it, there's nothing to suggest that he actually gave advice to um, working class people about their, their marriages. All the stuff that we have is to nobles, you know, noble ladies. Well, who could read. <laughs> yeah. Well, and somebody who could read it to them. Well, I mean, also, um, Gadmer doesn't suggest that in any way. So we, we don't know, you know, if he actually was... Apparently, he had a charism for, for giving advice to people that really fit their, their station well. But we don't know who he gave it to because the honor doesn't, doesn't tell us much. Uh, that was a long rambling answer. Sure. Yeah. Um, more of a metaphysical question. Okay. Question. So, you were talking about the. Uh, Bodily appetites kind of affecting the soul. Mm -hmm. So I guess how does what, that happen? How does that happen? What's what sort of? He doesn't tell us a story about that. Okay. Uh, he doesn't have an account of that, but um, he's more interested in the the stuff on the soul, and you know it has to do with with the will, whether the will consents to those appetites. Now this is where. Um, if we were to sort of extrapolate from Anselm and say, what if, you know, what if Anselm were to like sit down and get more, more detailed discussion of this? The will to happiness for Anselm is, you know, he distinguishes between will as like the instance of will, the, the actual willing, the usus, the instrument itself, and then these affections or inclinations of the will. And one of these is the will to happiness. That's always there in us, and it leads us towards what appeared to us beneficial or away from the heart. Um, and that's, that's, that's where we can end up sort of being damaged. That's, he doesn't come out and say vices reside in the will to happiness, but that's the only place they could, you know, within the structure. You can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but that's the only place I see that, that within his, his sort of anthropology, uh, vices could, could reside, lasting habitual structures. Um, and so the carnal appetites, I mean, think about it. If I, if I feel lust, and that carnal appetite is coming, you know, to me, um, he's got this sort of three-part thing, which is, you know, not original to him. There's, there's the, 
suggestion by the appetite, then there's a sort of delighting in it, considering it. Um, he talks about this more in the dicton summing. And then there's the actual consent of the will. I sort of take it on and say, okay, I'm going to go do that you know, thing I'm not supposed to do over there. Um, we damage ourselves in the process by this. And we can look at the way in which things work with the will like a one-time sort of deal. But the way in which we live as human beings is over time. And so if I've given in to my carnal appetites, um, I'm sort of setting myself up to have a harder time, even after justice is restored in the will. Unless, I'm, you know, maybe I keep working at it or something like that. Um, but he doesn't give us a lot of discussion of the mechanics, the metaphysical mechanism by which this happens. Yeah. So uh, you talked about friendship, you know, the introducing yeah. friendship as important. Um, uh, and then you mentioned that the passage where he commanded husbands loving the wives is that. Um, how did he think of, of, uh, of caritas or other forms of love? It, were they part of friendship or was... Um, well, do you Anselm, think of friendship as something opposed to that? Or? No, Anselm does not think that that amicitia and caritas are two distinct kinds of love. So he's not a uh, uh, you know C.S. Lewis for for loves kind of kind of guy. Um, and, and actually, a lot of you know a lot of authors, um, Alexio, amicitia. Caritas, Amor, these all tend to coincide. Even, even in Thomas Aquinas, we see that there's a lot of overlap between these. You know, Caritas is the perfection of love that could happen in, in, in terms of friendship. So Anselm does talk quite a bit about, about Caritas as well. Um, and a real friendship is going to have, it's going to be inhabited by Caritas. And a real friendship, this is where it gets, it gets really interesting, a real friendship which could be a family relation, it could be, you know, between, say, colleagues, it could be uh, my, my wife and I. It's, uh, it's going to involve a concordance of will, where neither one of us tries to force our own will on the other, but tries to work for the benefit of the other. Um, and where we're sort of giving in uh, through, through charity, uh, so long as it doesn't involve, you know, sinning. Um, and it's necessarily going to extend itself more broadly than just our individual relationship. Because, to uh, at the very least, it's going to you know we're we're hopefully going to be in harmony with the rest of the, the church, you know those in in heaven. Um, insofar as we're not, it's because we're screwed up, because <laughs> our love is imperfect. Um, but it, but it also should extend within you know temporal society as well. Um, if if my wife and I are really having a good marriage, that should spill over. In to, um, how things are between myself and some colleagues, or you know, even the political order. Again, a very far-ranging answer to yeah. I just so. wanted to mention an answer to the sort of influence question. I mean, did Good. Augustine talk about yeah. friendship between oh yeah, and and so so that would be. Yeah, and the good of marriage. Yeah, and yeah. of course, you know, if you're obviously and someone read the confessions and here's Monica, you know, yeah. trying to temper the you know, the, the angry husband. And, and I get the feeling Anselm had a sort of similar family setup as, oh, as yeah. Anselm had. So like a good relationship with his mom and you know, his dad, yeah. Kind of worried about you know, his dad. He couldn't yeah, he couldn't get along with it. That's a really interesting point. And I didn't put it in here, but there are these letters, um, to his sister and her husband, uh, and, and they don't tell us an awful lot about you know what marriage ought to look like. But some of it is is oh, am I out of time? Or? Okay, some of it is, is sort of um, you know should he should he go off and, and, and you know go on pilgrimage? That that's fine, that sort of thing. But then some of it is about you know consoling them for how many of their children have, have died, and those children are going to be you know they're sort of part of the community now with them. Um, yeah, Anselm himself did not have a happy family life. Um, his mother dies fairly young. His dad, he's left with his dad who he can't get along with. He tries to get away, you know. So, I, yeah, I think that there could be. Uh, maybe he doesn't write about marriage that much because he didn't uh, 
he didn't see that enough in his his own <laughs> life. You know? I, I don't really know why he, he didn't write that much about marriage. I can tell you this too. Maybe he thought that Augustine had done that. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. That, there could be that too. Or or you know, it's not just uh, Augustine, but also uh, Gregory and, and Ambrose and people you know, all have written about you know to some degree the duties that people have to each other. Um, the last thing I'll say is. Anselm doesn't spend much time talking even about lust. You know, when it comes to the vices, that's not a big one for him. But that's typically monastic, because you know, if you if you look at um, lust and gluttony, you want to get those under control. But those aren't the ones that are really problematic. It's pride, envy, vainglory, those sorts of things. Those will tear you tear you apart. You know, these are just bodily. You know, um, so he doesn't spend that much time. Thank you very much.